so this is going to be a slightly different talk. I tend to find that um, if I'm anything, I'm a more useful person than an interesting one. So when Remy asked me to give a talk about uh, fairly subjective stuff, I was a bit nervous initially, a bit apprehensive. So it's not going to cover any technical stuff. It's a very non-technical talk, but it deals with, very candidly, very frankly, deals with just how I run a consultancy business, how I work with clients, how we cost projects, how I work out how much they're going to pay me, and what those kind of engagements will look like. Uh, I'm a self-employed consultant, uh, which kind of important thing for me is the self-employment bit. There isn't a team, there is just me. So I am CEO, CFO, cleaner, janitor, everything. So for me, running a business is quite an interesting thing. Uh, as you'll find out later in the talk, I'm not a very good businessman. I'm not really driven by money. Um, but this talk will look about how I run a consultancy, helping clients to understand the value and the shape and the size of things around web performance. I tend, not exclusively, but I do tend to work with fairly big companies. They are the people most likely to feel the benefit of web performance. They also tend to have bigger budgets, right? Um, but that's not always been the case. I actually started my career doing css -y things, CSS architecture, design systems. And I did say this is going to be a very honest talk. Um, about two years ago, I just made a very conscious decision. I want to focus almost exclusively on web perf. Stop looking at CSS, stop looking at design systems. Um, lots of reasons for that, which I'm not going to cover those at all in the talk. One thing I realized after this decision is the shape of things is completely different now for me. So um, basically, there's a lot more money involved in web perf. Uh, value, uh, sorry, the average value of a project goes up. And this is basically because, not that design systems are not valuable, um, but any client who sort of kicks off a design systems project has to be a visionary client. They're looking the next two to five years for cost savings, whereas WebPerf has pretty much immediate returns. And the business is way more aware of that. So it just means that uh, the discussions around performance, uh, just from a business point of view, are very, very different for me. So I've had to learn kind of quite quickly how to adapt to that. And this talk's going to look at a lot of those things. So right off the bat, the most important thing for me is asking the right questions. This is absolutely vital for me. I don't have weeks and weeks and weeks to onboard myself. When I'm working with a client, I need to be effective from day one. Um, so asking the right questions is vital to me. I've actually got a very secret GitHub repository of all my bestest ever business questions. So I just keep a note of them. And if they're effective and give me insightful answers, I'll roll them out the next time. Um, it's because I don't have all the answers. And this took me a long time to realize. Oh, that sounds so big-headed, doesn't it? It took me a long time to realize. I initially, when I started doing consultancy work, I thought, well, I can't ask my client questions because they'll think I'm a fraud, right? I'm supposed to have all the answers. This is very detrimental to my work, right? It meant I was kind of paralyzed a lot of the time, didn't know how to move or how to act because I was like, oh, shit, like, I'm meant to be the one with the answers. I can't ask them any questions. Incredibly naive of me, very, very naive. So now I've come to the realization that there are certain things I could never possibly know without asking the client for the answers. So that's a huge part of my business, asking the right questions. Four quite pertinent ones to this talk that I've cherry-picked out of the repository, uh, this little GitHub, GitHub repo, is one, how do you know the website is slow? And on the face of it, it's a very simple question, but the answer can be very insightful. If a client tells me, well, look at it, it's slow, right? It's slow. That's a valid answer, but it's a very emotional response to the problem. Conversely, and very rarely, a client might tell me, oh, well, our tooling has showed that every time we run slowly, conversions drop by X percent. An answer like that tells me they've already done some business analysis, they already understand the shape of things, and it's going to be a more kind of uh, simple onboarding process because they're bought into the idea already. Um, second question, what key area of the site should I look at? Again, on the face of it, a very simple question. This time, it's a really simple answer. I just get the client to tell me what to do. Naively, previously, I'd be like, well, I've got an entire site to look at, hundreds of pages. Where do I start? Just waste time. So I literally get the client to give me it on a plate. What do you want me to look at? What pages are important to you? What key flows do I need to work, uh, focus on? Next one, uh, what will being faster mean for the business? Because, dirty secret, kind of skipping ahead a few slides, no one actually hires me to build them a faster website. They just want a more effective one. So I need to know, what is your goal, right? Is it increased conversions, high number of signups? Do you want to um, solicit more donations? And finally, how do we intend to measure this? What are your KPIs? What are your metrics? How do I know when to stop? How do I know when we've won? So yeah, I mentioned this briefly, but nobody wants a faster website. If my clients genuinely just wanted the fastest website, I'd go in and delete all their CSS, remove all the JavaScript, and they'd get a Times New Roman jobby, right? And that'd be done. There's the fastest website. That's not pragmatic. That's not going to work. That's not going to wash. So basically, what I have to do is accept that I am part of a much bigger picture, and performance is just one of the angles that we need to attack uh, the project by, right? So yeah, they all, uh, clients of mine do not necessarily want the fastest website. They want a site that's going to make them the most money, get them the most donations, raise the most um, awareness, capture the most engagement. 
a case study from this year. I've got a lot of case studies in the talk. Some of them are heavily anonymized, understandably. Um, but this was from a newspaper uh, in North America. This is obviously paraphrased. Their opening email was a bit bigger than this. But they were very frank and very honest and said, look, we make a shit ton of money off of ads. But we're worried that there are too many. And we're getting to the point where engagement is dropping off. So I was hired to basically find the inflection point. There is a point at which, obviously, adding ads will make you more revenue. But add too many, it's going to affect engagement. And this means you've got a bell curve for whatever your, your sweet spot of your revenue is. They hired me to find that for them. And it's a really interesting project. Um, ultimately, what their email was basically saying is, how far can we push this, right? What can we get away with? We don't want to be the fastest. We need to be pragmatic, right? We just want to make the most money possible. Uh, so actually, yeah, leave ethics and stuff aside for this talk. <laughs> how far can we push this, right? It's quite fitting to follow up Laura's talk with a you know, talk about making ads faster. This is a really interesting project for me, because it didn't challenge morals. Ads aren't immoral, right? They're not immoral. They're just ugly. Um, this is a really interesting project for me, and it was a success. The client told me what to do. Don't touch our revenue streams. Do not affect our income. Make the site faster. So they told me what to do. I'll just do everything around that. Site got 6.2 seconds faster on mobile. Really, really successful project. Um, but I'm just getting the client to tell me what to focus on. This one should go without saying. If you can't measure it, you can't fix it. If you don't know the shape of things, you've got no chance of improving them. So the biggest part of my job, the biggest part of any performance engineer's job, is capturing data, lots of it. Spend a lot of time gathering as much data as you can. When you think you've got just about enough, keep on going. I've never once regretted the amount of data I've had. I've only regretted not having enough. Capture as much as you can. This is quite difficult for me because at the point I engage with a client, they're unlikely to have the relevant tooling in place. The amount of data we've got to work with isn't very good. I will then fall back to, I will defer to analytics. So Google Analytics is imperfect. I'll explain why in a second, but I find that 90%, maybe more of the clients I work with have an analytics account installed on their site. Uh, we can gather rudimentary performance information from there. Uh, the reason it's imperfect is it gives you average data, and by average, they mean the mean. Useless in performance circles. We want to talk about percentiles. Median, 95th percentile. We can drill down a bit further, but it's not great. By default, Google Analytics only samples 1% of your traffic for performance data. You can configure it to 100% or any percentage you like, but my client has never done that, right? They don't do that. It's not until I tell them to do that. So we're only dealing with a smaller subset of the data. On a big enough site, 1% is probably all right. But on medium size, sort of medium traffic sites, 1% is probably a little less than ideal. Uh, the data is very coarse, right? What it does is analytics will take the average load time of every page on the site in every country in the world, every browser, every device type, and just average that out. So the number you're left looking at is very, very coarse. And finally, um, it focuses on load times, right? It gives us load times. It's a legacy metric. We don't care about load anymore. It's a good proxy for performance. If you've got 70 second load times, you probably don't have a fast website. But we don't really want to focus on load too much. But anyway, any data is better than none. My favorite ever case study ever from a client project um, happened last year, basically, um, about 18 months ago, perhaps. I was working for a company in Tallinn, Estonia. I can't tell you who they are, and I can't tell you what they do, what I can tell you is they deal in Bitcoin, which sounds dodgy as fuck, right? <laughs> um, but no, it's legit. It's a legit business. I just can't name them. And um, I had a meeting with their CEO. This is another thing that happens. When you're dealing with WebPerf, because it affects the bottom line so dramatically, I get meetings with CEOs and CFOs, and it's terrifying. I said to them, I said to the CEO, do you, understand, do you know about your Venezuela problem? Oh, let's actually, let's go to Venezuela. Do you know about your Venezuela problem? I on purpose asked this very aloof question because I wanted to solicit a response of what you're on about. I said, exactly, right? You've got an amazing Venezuela problem and I can help you fix it. So what ended up happening was, when I was tinkering around in analytics, there's this really fun, uh, my idea of fun at least, it's a nice little view of the world and how fast your website is. This website was really, really slow. Average global load times around 16 seconds. And the client had told me, because I asked them, I asked the right questions, uh, they told me, focus on Southeast Asia. That's our biggest market. That's a key area for us. It's a key problem for us. And if you look at Southeast Asia, lots of dark blue, very, very slow. I went off piste a little bit. I went way over to the west, because Venezuela was really dark blue as well. What I found interesting about this is, why isn't Brazil really dark blue? Why isn't Colombia really dark blue? Why Venezuela? It isn't digging. It turns out Venezuela is a really highly trafficked. Big hot swapping me out. Yeah. Cool. Just make you twice as loud. Two mics. Um, 
Right, why Venezuela? Why not Colombia? Why not Brazil? Why is it Venezuela? So I did a bit of digging. A lot of traffic was coming from Venezuela. And I found that I learned three very interesting things. Actually, the first one I already kind of knew. Unfortunately, Venezuela's economy is tanked, right? They're not doing too well. Inflation was at a million percent uh, in the middle of uh, 2018. Not good at all. So Venezuelans want to get their hands on any not Venezuelan currency. By default, that's going to be US dollars, the de facto world currency. Um, but Bitcoin counts, right, as a not Venezuelan currency. That point number one. Second thing is, their government minted a cryptocurrency called Petro in order to try and restabilize the economy. Terrible idea, didn't work, never going to work. Uh, interestingly, as of August 2018, Petro couldn't be found on any of the major exchanges. It's a Mickey Mouse currency. All of a sudden, you've got an entire nation predisposed to the idea of Bitcoin, right? the idea of cryptocurrency. You go to the average person in the high street in Brighton, probably never even heard of Bitcoin. You've now got an entire country that's predisposed to the idea. The third and by far the most fascinating thing I learned about Venezuela, electricity is free. They're printing money, right? They leave their machine on overnight, and they've made eight pence by the morning, right? They're just making money for free. <laughs> Huge government subsidies coupled with hyperinflation means that Venezuelans don't pay for electricity. It's basically completely free. So you've got an entire country just printing money. No wonder the economy's fucked. You've got an entire country just printing money. They want to go and spend it somewhere, and they flock to my client's website to try and spend it. This was fascinating for me. I told the CEO this, and he was like, oh, I had no idea this was going on. I was like, no, I know you didn't, right? Because you didn't know where to look. So I went to Tim Cadleck's webworldwide.io, and I found out the average information about the sort of state of the internet in Venezuela. And when I was in the office in Tallinn, I went around every engineer's machine, and I made their machine run over a Venezuelan connection. I basically annoyed the engineers into doing a better job, and it worked. With a dedicated focus on Venezuela, performance uh, was just vastly, vastly improved. Uh, numerous ways we got there, not really relevant to this talk. This shows the site's global load times. Um, that huge spike, this is really bad. Please let me finish the story before you judge me. That huge spike where load times hit around 100 seconds, that was the first day I started working with them. <laughs> Not my fault, right? Don't judge me yet. Uh, what ended up happening was, um, the first day I started working with them, they had a third-party synchronous JavaScript provider that had an outage. That leads to, effectively, a TCP timeout, which on a Unix machine is 80 seconds, right? So 1.3 minutes. They had an outage. They didn't know this was happening, right? They had no reporting in live. I found this via analytics. Um, so that wasn't my fault, right? It just happened to be very coincidental, I promise. Actually serves as a really good marker for me, though, because whenever I look back at these graphs, I can tell that that's when we started working together. Look at the left of the graph. Average global load times are around sort of 16 to 18 seconds. After our week working together, they went down to around six. So still a lot of work to be done, but cutting load times down to a third in about a week was tremendous for this company. If we look at Venezuela, that big spike is actually pushing 400 seconds. And if you look at the load times on the right-hand side of that, they are dwarfed so much you can't even see them on the graph, right? The load times are dwarfed by this 400 seconds. But look at the left. These spikes here are 150, 200 seconds, average load time in Venezuela. This project was such an incredible, this client loves me. They absolutely adore me. This project made them millions, and I'm talking several millions. It's Bitcoin, so it doesn't count, but it's still millions, right? <laughs> um, that's, 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 the, that's the worst thing about this whole story, is right, it's not real money though, Harry, so stop showing off. Um, this made them so much money uh, globally that they, they just, they adore me, trust me. Uh, but from Venezuela alone, they made so much cash, they hired someone just to keep a eye on it. They hired a full-time member of staff just to keep an eye on how much money was coming in from Venezuela. Uh, they called them a client success manager, but basically it was a person whose job it was to keep an eye on Latin America, changes in the market there. This company had no idea this was happening, right? They managed to tap into an entire economy, and I sound like I'm showing off, um, largely because I am, I guess. <laughs> I'm not showing off. All I'm trying to say is, it just takes one person with the right access to the right data to achieve this kind of stuff. Right? That's why I kind of demand when I work with clients, give me access to your data, give me access to your tooling. This client made so much cash, they had to hire a person to look after it all. Follow the numbers. Um, this is a quick sort of, well, not anecdote, I guess, maybe a little bit. Um, I came across this literally yesterday, and I come across it all the time in my work. You'll get points where the numbers seem wrong, and it goes against all your better judgment. In cases like this, I tend to doubt myself first. A human is, a human is error prone. I'm incredibly error prone. I had it yesterday in a graph, and I was like, this can't be right. I've got, this, I've got all my numbers right. Turns out I was wrong. In any scenario you get where the numbers don't uh, marry up with what you think should be happening, trust the numbers first. Numbers very, very rarely lie. They're usually telling the truth. Um, 
we had a case study. Um, I worked last year with Squarespace. Quite a lot of work that we did together. Uh, one of the parts of the project was to focus on the head tags. You'll find out during this talk, uh, and if you ever come to like a workshop of mine or we ever work together, I am obsessed with head tags. Head tags are pivotal to performance. So one of the tasks I put on their backlog was go and tidy your head tags up. There was a theoretical perfect order for your head tags. Um, this isn't it, I'm not giving you my secrets. Uh, but I said to them, go and tidy up your head tags, right? This should be theoretically knowing how browsers work, X, Y, and Z, whatever. They put it live and the whole thing got slower. No matter which way we sliced it, no matter how we measured it, from which angle we looked at the data, the site got slower. And what I couldn't do is sit there like, well, no, actually, I, it should be working, right? In theory, this is correct. Theory goes out the window. As soon as you get into prod, as soon as you go live, always follow the numbers. So we reverted it, right? It was effectively wasted time, but at least we proved the point that, okay, that doesn't work for us. Next thing, kind of counterintuitively, um, in WebPerf, it's really important to move slowly. Uh, I've made this mistake myself many times, and I've always regretted it. Uh, sort of that excitement, oh, we can fix this, we can get it live, we can fix it immediately. This leads to loads of problems further down the line. So kind of counterintuitively, take your time. There's probably no rush. This site has probably been slow for weeks or months already. The size of companies I work with, it probably takes about two months to onboard me anyway. Doing the paperwork for certain clients can take upwards of six months to even get in the building. There is probably no rush. The site's been slow for a while, it doesn't need fixing immediately. It's tempting to do so, and it's quite exciting to do so. Right, new project, let's get it fixed. All this dead time we've got, use it to your advantage. Spend all of this time gathering data, measure things, get the tooling set up correctly while you're waiting to start the project. I mentioned it before, but I've only ever regretted not having enough data. Measure pertinent things. Um, if I'm just deferring back to inaccurate analytics data, that's not great. If I can spend two months putting speed curve on the site, then I can get really good, really accurate data before we even start. So it's uh, really important to take your time when onboarding a client. Next thing is take your time when you're actually working with them. Re release things incrementally. Clients of mine have two temptations, right? One is, well, we've got CI, we can release many times a day, so let's just hammer everything out. As soon as we fix it, release it, fix it, release it. That gives you no granularity. That doesn't allow you to see what changes had the most impact. The other thing they will do is they'll just wait until the end of the project and have like 170 commits they put live in one, and they've got this big bang kind of, oh yeah, the site is now faster, which is good in the long run, but really what we want to do is have one thematic release per day, or week, or whatever your release cycle is. Um, Day one, optimize images. Day two, sort the head tags. Day three, deal with third parties. Whatever it is, drip feed these changes live slowly. It allows you to work out what was most effective. For clients of mine, it's important to know that, oh yeah, um, changing start render had a dramatic impact on revenue. So next time we slow down, first thing to look at is start render. Conversely, they might work out, oh yeah, we lazy loaded the images, right? We put that live on Wednesday, but bounce rate went up because, oh, it turns out the images take too long to arrive, so engagement suffers. The second one is the most interesting one to me. Work out what not to do. Find out what doesn't work. If anyone's ever worked with me, or, or like I say, be in one of my workshops, this is my favorite sound by ever, right? Maximize the work not done. Be lazy, but be smart about it, right? Not lazy, lazy, like good lazy. Maximizing the work not done is basically about having a strategy. And when you make any strategy for anything, knowing what not to do is just as important as knowing what to do. I need to work out with my clients, what are we not gonna do? What are we gonna avoid? What are we not gonna waste time on? Um, case study of this one, um, trying to remember, this is a brand new talk, so I'm like, these slides are a surprise to me as well. I can't name this client, and it is anonymized, I hope. Looking at some performance data from analytics, looking at this data, we can see that a staggering 73% of visits have a load time of under three seconds. 22% of those have a load time of under a second. First thing I think when I see this is, oh, shit, my job's really difficult now. This site's already pretty fast. But then I think, well, what do I need to do? Right, what I need to do is move that big sort of one to three seconds into the zero to one, right? Wrong. What we did is we corroborated this data, we cross-referenced it with speed curve and found out that the sweet spot for conversions is page load times around two seconds. Our median load time was 2.9, so we've got a lot of work to do, but nudging a one and a half second load time into a 0.5 second is really difficult work. And you're really in the weeds there and it's gonna take a long time. Shifting a six toward a three and a three toward a two is much easier. This is great, right? We're working out what not to do, and it turns out it's the easier work that it needs doing. Uh, ooh, another case study, Vitamix. Possibly one of my favorite ever clients, because they're just adorable, like the nicest team I've probably ever worked with. Um, their web team's really small and very, um, what's the word? Just open to suggestions, right? They move very quickly. We did some really great work together, uh, Vitamix and I, earlier this year. Now, one of the first things I do when I work with a new client is I just ask them, 
who are your closest competitors, right? We might not necessarily need to beat them at performance, but it grounds things, right? It gives us a baseline to work with. And what we found is that their load times were by far the best. This is on an actual Moto G4 on a 3G connection. Their load times are already the best. However, start render, they were about third. Well, not about third, exactly third. They were third place. Um, so there's no point improving load anymore. We've already got the fastest load times. Leave it alone. Don't bother. It told me not to focus on load times, which is also good because we don't care, right? Load times are a legacy metric. Our job is to focus on start render for this project. Um, this is good news for me because it defines what the actual project is going to look like. What do we focus on? Start render. Ignore load times. Don't worry about that. You know, that will sort itself out. And what this tells me, if we very, very like proxy the, um, like work it back from knowing this, load is basically sub-resources. You want to improve your load, time, load times, you reduce resources, you lazy load them, you optimize them, you do all that kind of stuff. Conversely, start render is basically your head tags. Totally, right? Obsessed with head tags. In order to improve start render, you're generally going to want to stay in the head of the document. So we spent a full week. I went out to Ohio, where they're based. We had a bit of a performance hackathon. We basically spent a week working on the one bit of the site a customer never sees, right? We spent an entire week in the head tags. Absolutely the right thing to do. We're now first place for both. We're the only company on here with a sub four second start render. Um, the second fastest is a, a second and a half slower than us. So we are faster by a considerable margin. And incidentally, it just so happened that um, we also still have the fastest load time. Load time's got faster as well. What I can't show you, unfortunately, is how this pro this is a great success, right? I can't show you the, the graph of their revenue after this because it made a massive difference. Conversions were just dramatically improved by this body of work. All just from working out what I didn't need to focus on. Um, not a client of mine, unfortunately. Um, a little software company called Apple. Um, if you're listening, I they are probably listening. I've got three eye devices up here. Uh, if you're listening, Apple, you can hire me. <laughs> just for the purposes of this talk, I did some uh, benchmarks on apple.com. This is an ugly graph, right? But I spend a lot of time looking at graphs exactly like this. I don't need to click around the website. I ask the client, tell me what pages to look at. And in this case, we've got home page, uh, category page is iPhone. Um, product page was the iPhone 11 Pro, and the PDP was the iPhone 11 Pro purchase page. And finally, we've got a search results page. I just grab a load of static analysis, loads of uh, milestone timings. Just looking at this graph, without even looking at a single line of source code, I know exactly what my project's going to look like. First thing I notice is, Jesus, the PDP's got something going on, right? The product details page needs some key attention, right? So I'll literally write this pen and paper, one, focus on PDP. Something's going wrong here. Next thing, time to first byte is really static. It's very, very uh, sort of stable. What this tells me is that there isn't a particular page that has erratic database queries or expensive API calls, right? That means that I can probably uh, either not focus on back-end performance at all, or any improvement to back-end performance on one page should propagate across all of them. <laughs> Next up, we're seeing um, a gap between first paint and first contentful paint. Now, first paint is the first pixel that changes or the first thing that changes on the screen. First contentful paint is the first image or bit of text. Knowing there's a delta between these tells me that we've probably got a font loading problem, right? We've got a paint, but not a contentful paint. It's either images or fonts. Nine times out of 10, it's fonts. So next thing I write down is go and look at using font display or use a font loading strategy. Uh, next two are fairly similar to one another. We've got a gap here between, um, which one's this? Uh, first contentful paint and last painted hero. So last painted hero is the last big image that gets painted to screen. If the contentful paint is at X, but the last painted hero is at Y, that delta there is just a big image. I need to optimize that image, optimize the delivery of that image. So on these pages, I need to look at image optimization. Uh, similar story here between start, uh, first contentful paint and speed index. Speed index is a measure of useful updates to the view. So if we're not doing useful updates for a long time, that means that above the fold content needs optimizing. Um, load times are really erratic, but because time to first byte is quite static, these deltas, these constantly changing uh, sort of widening gaps, tells me that um, the, pages all, the pages all arrive around a similar time. Right? It's a proxy, but time to first byte is static enough. The pages themselves are arriving quite quickly. The load event, that delta is sub-resources. So on a particularly high uh, chart or a high bar, that page, I need to look at images, scripts, whatever. That's optimizing sub-resources. Ooh, geez, right, uh, time to interactive. Lay off the JavaScript, basically. Um, especially on the PDP, the page doesn't become interactive until well after everything else is finished. This is going to need solving. And finally, and this is my most interesting one, uh, as in the one I'm most interested in, um, start render is very static on the first three pages, but it jumps up towards the lat latter two. 
I can basically work out from here that those other two pages are built on a different technology stack. So kind of an odd thing to be able to proxy, but if you work back logically, start render is basically your render blocking items. Your render blocking items live in the head. These last two pages must have different head tags for some reason. I'm obsessed with head tags. If these two pages have got different head tags, they're probably built on a different stack. And just out of interest, I didn't look at any of the pages before I ran these tests. I went back and I looked at this and it turns out, yeah, these two pages are built on different stacks. They go off to different, entire different um, sort of platforms, different applications. You can work out if somebody's using a different uh, technology stack if they've got two different start renders, right? You can work that out by looking at these graphs. Did I mention my job's really exciting? I don't think I did, did I? So yeah, um, all of that, just looking at one graph, I've managed to solve basically my entire backlog. I know what to focus on, I know what, where to dedicate my attention. Most importantly, I know what not to do. Uh, ooh, the good stuff. Hands up if you've ever struggled to sell the idea of performance to a client. Me too, which is freaking weird, because that's the only reason they email me. <laughs> hey, Harry, can we make the site faster? Yeah, of course. Why should we? I don't know, you emailed me. <laughs> Honestly, that happens to me. I've had it quite a lot. I'm like, uh, I don't know, you, you, you messaged me. Um, okay, this is where I come back to, like, I am not a businessman. I am not a business person. not very good at doing businesses. But the best bit of advice I was ever given about business was given to direct me directly by a buddy of mine called Oliver Reichenstein. Uh, he told me this years ago, like I'm talking a decade ago maybe. Don't do it for the money, but never do it for no money. And this just always stuck with me. Basically, don't make money your motivator, don't be greedy, because clients see through that, and it erodes the exact trust that a consultant needs. But also, don't get mugged off, right? And I'm really bad at the second one. I'll deal with a client, and while, they're kind of, while we're courting each other, trying to work out if we'll work together, I'll just put an email, oh, by the way, I've solved this for you. It's like, shit, Harry, don't do that. They need to pay you first. So yeah, I'm still finding my feet, I'll happily admit. But one thing I have noticed is that, and we all know it, performance is directly correlated to the bottom line. My clients know this. The only reason they've emailed me is because they either stand to save or make money out of me, right? So I need to be very candid with the fact that, yeah, okay, I'm gonna charge you for that. This is not a good time to be shy. <coughs> case study here, it's a very short case study, but one of my first ever full 100% only performance projects Try and represent, Ellie's in here somewhere. She's not turned up for my talk. Anyway, um, Try one of my first ever uh, performance clients. Woo! Um, by their own admission, by their own measurements, they found out if customers, uh, sorry, if they could make the site 0.3 seconds faster, customers would spend an extra eight million pounds a year. For 0.3 seconds, like we could find 0.3 seconds with our eyes closed. 0.3 seconds equals eight mil. Now, what I should have done with train line is said, well, if I, find, if I can find you 0.3 seconds, can I keep 0.3 mil? <laughs> you laugh, but I should have done. It's a bargain for them. I was a naive. I gave them a day rate, and they paid me, you know, small figures. Made 8 mil out of this. What a mug. So now, what I'm trying very hard to do is work to a value-based pricing model. Anybody do value-based pricing? Yeah, a little bit. It's scary, right? It's difficult. Uh, it's defined by Alan Weiss as, uh, my fee represents my contribution to the project with a dramatic return on investment for you and equitable compensation for me. What we're basically doing is, we'll work out how much this project is worth, and I'll charge you a proportion of that that you're happy to pay and I'm happy to earn. And the only constant is the quality and the level of the work, right? So I usually get emails like this, hey, how much are we likely to make from this project? Ridiculous question. But naively, I used to try and answer it for them. I used to try and answer it for my clients. How am I meant to know the answer to this? I don't know how much you make right now. I don't know what your projected growth is. I don't know what your uh, attrition is. I don't know anything about how your business works. I am not well poised to answer this question, yet I used to try, and it never really worked out. So I reversed it. I said, well, how have you calculated the value of this project? People don't just initiate projects for no reason. Somebody internally knows that making the site faster is going to make them more money. So I ask them, how do you, work? How do you know that? Usually they don't have an answer, actually. Usually they're like, oh, we haven't. We just know it will make us faster. So, well, you need to know how much, right? Because if you don't know how much you're going to make off this, you don't know if I'm charging you too much or too little, right? We need to work this out together because I am not your business analyst. If I just trotted out the figure, oh, well, actually, Trainline made an extra 8 million by being 0.3 seconds faster, the client's like, oh, sick. We only make 5 million a year. We'd love to make an extra 8. <laughs> not going to work, is it? I'm just very honest with my clients. I cannot possibly tell you that answer. How am I supposed to know? I'm not a business analyst. I'm certainly not your business analyst. But I can be if you pay me. So what I start doing with clients now is saying, look, if you haven't worked out the value of this project, we have a phase zero. We need to work together on a phase zero to work this out for you. We can do that. So phase zero, I'll just set them up like a free speed curve account. It's a period of pre-engagement where we work out how much the value of the project is to them, so then I know how much value it is to me. 
we know how much they're going to make, then I, find I can work out what slice of that pie I get to keep. So yeah, set up a free speed curve account. I always find speed curve is easiest to like show, don't tell. Set up a free <laughs> speed curve account on your client's behalf. When they see the data, they're like, where well, we want this. It's the cheapest 18 grand you ever spend. Speed curve is beautiful. So we gather the data. And this time, we're not capturing load times or start render. We capture actual customer data. Right? What's your conversion rate? How is that affected by performance? What's your average order value? What's your bounce rate? And what's your engagement like? How many minutes of video do people watch? We can measure business data and correlate it back to performance. Also run A-B tests. Again, unfortunately, I have to anonymize this client. We found out that um, if they can start rendering in under three seconds on mobile, they make three times more conversions than if they start rendering after six seconds. Internally, they can put a number on that. They know what three, time increase, uh, three times increasing conversions would look like. They're business analysts or whoever it is, they can work that out. They can work out the value of this project. I know what the project is. My job is to move all these folk over to that side there, all right? Put numbers against it. This is a food blog. Most of their money comes from ads. What we worked out was we measured how quickly they managed to render the main recipe image. The sweet spot where they get the fewest bounces is if we can render the image in 0.4 to 0.5 seconds. Very ambitious. Currently, we're achieving <laughs> half that, right? About a second. We can work out, well, if we can get this image somehow into that 500 millisecond bucket, your bounce rate is going to be much lower, your revenue is going to be much higher. They can correlate back what um, this increase in engagement will work in financial terms. If they know that their average revenue is X and we can improve that by X amount of engagement, we can put numbers against this. A-B tests, this is one of my favorites. I've got a bit of a love-hate, oh no, no, just a hate-hate, I guess. A hate-hate relationship with cloud typography. They are the slowest font provider on the market by a long, long way, and they know they are, because I'd message them and say, hey, I can help you fix this. Their official word is, we don't care, leave us alone. <laughs> I'm not kidding, right? It's, it's hot drama. The CEO started tweeting at me. You've got your information wrong. I was like, well, I'll get you some information, buddy. <laughs> we ran an A-B test on a client website. What does bounce rate look like with and without cloud typography? The painful irony here is that cloud typography is pretty expensive. They're spending money on it. And what it's doing is taking revenue away from the client. We can now prove that if we redress the balance, zero your spend on fonts, revenue goes up. It's the best way around to have things. We can prove this. We can put numbers against all of these things. Now my proposal email to a client is as simple as this. If we could start rendering in a 0.9 second time frame, you stand to make around 8% more conversions a year. Across the year, that's worth 1 to 1.2 mil, and I'll take whatever percentage I decide is appropriate, maybe 5%. That's fair, right? You'd spend 5% to get the other 95, especially if it's worth millions. This is how value-based pricing works. It's scary, and not all clients will go for it, um, but it's a really good way of actually getting everyone equally invested in the project, right? I've got a stake at share, you know, a share at stake. Um, so do they, right? So it brings everyone in, and we all understand the goals. Ooh-wee, right. Keeping on top of things. Once we've done all this, I'm missing out the entire bit where I do all this, by the way. This isn't a technical talk. I will have done all this. We've achieved it, whatever. The next thing is to keep on top of things. And this is where things get difficult. Actually making sure that the performance culture sticks is probably the hardest part of it. Making a site fast is easy. Actually, you know, in order, making a fast website is easy. Making a website fast is a little bit harder. Keeping a website fast is really difficult. And this is where my clients need most help. One thing I sort of pride myself on is I help them set performance budgets really pragmatically, right? A lot of people struggle setting performance budgets. Anybody ever asked or been asked this question or wondered how do I set a performance budget? What should my budget be? Anybody wondered this before? Well, not enough of you. Well, you're now thinking it, right? So by virtue of just reading that, you're thinking. I've got a really good pragmatic answer to this, right? A one size fits all. Set your performance budget to whatever your worst point in the last two weeks was. My clients don't need challenges, they need safety. And tweet that one. They don't need challenges, we don't need ambitious uh, performance budgets. They need something to stop them regressing. Setting ambitious performance budgets is way too difficult for the stage these clients are normally at. What I don't want to set them is a challenge to get start render down to X. We just need to make sure we at least maintain where we're currently at. So here's a client, an example. We had set start render to three seconds on mobile. This is a two week snapshot of this client. Turns out the slowest actual start render in this entire two week period was 2.2 sec uh, seconds. So now for the next two weeks, we bring the red horizontal down, uh, line down to touch the highest peak. That's your next two weeks of budget. We're not aiming for something, we're just setting an upper limit. This budget, it turns out that three days across the two weeks, uh, we topped out. 
We didn't go over budget, which is great, but this, this budget doesn't change. We leave this as it is. The budget is set to whatever your lowest point in the last two weeks was. This means we're not regressing, but we're not achieving, right? So we just leave this one as it is. We might have this kind of graph, though, where we're really not doing very well at all. Every single day, we're way over budget, and this is where we need to double down. You're not allowed to raise the bar back up, right? You can't just change the test so that it passes. You can't change your performance budget so that you're within it. This is a page or a view or whatever this chart is representing where we need to double down and do extra work. The next thing I'm keen to do with clients is normalize performance. I just tell my clients to do things as simple as talk about it like it's always been there, right? Just mention it in passing. Be so nonchalant about web performance that everyone just assumes it's always been there. Bring it up in stand-ups, bring it up in retros. Um, when you're doing feature scoping, say, yeah, we can build this, but I need to assess the performance impact. Normalize it to the point where people just expect to hear about it. Um, and also, this is a good one, have dashboards for specific teams. So I set up dashboards for the business team, like the BI team, your business insights team. They don't care about start render, they care about signups, or not signups, rather, uh, conversions, whatever. Oh, this is really dim, I'm sorry about that. A dashboard just for A-B tests. Right? Don't let your A-B tests get lost, right? Make sure they're front and center. A dashboard for your marketing team. How did adding the Facebook tracking pixel affect conversions, right? Did it. Um, how does web performance affect email signups, right? Does it. Technical insights for me is things like, is our head parse time acceptable? How is the parse time of the head tags affecting start render and thus conversions? Have different dashboards for different thematic groups of the company. And ultimately, what I'm trying to do here is blur the lines. I don't actually want anyone to talk about performance, right? Performance is just a proxy for other business successes. I don't really want engineers to discuss head pass time. I want engineers to realize that that release has just reduced conversions by 0.8%, right? I want them to worry about that. Performance is just a proxy for everything else. So ultimately, I'm trying to get rid of the performance discussion entirely and replace it with actually sort of fundamentally important things to that organization. Finally, I think, slash, no, I, no, I promise, finally, Know when to stop. This is really important. Good enough is exactly that, right? It's good enough. You need to know when to stop. Web performance projects never truly finish, but at some point they will switch from active to passive mode. The reason you need to know when to stop is because you can easily get obsessed and blindsided, right? You can do all the low-hanging fruit, and you get 10-second load times down to 3, and you get 3 down to 2.5, and 2.5 and down to 1.9. And you're scraping around now for milliseconds, and it's going to take weeks to claw back time that is never really going to be gained or felt. You get so obsessed that you kind of forget to zoom out and think, oh, wait, if we actually just added Apple Pay to the checkout process, we could increase conversions by 17%, right? It's all about looking at bigger pictures. Performance is just a thin slice of an organization. It's important, but it's not the most important. So know when to stop. Good enough is good enough. And I've gone under time. I was worried this talk was going to go over. 99 slides. I'm just going to say thank you very much. I'm going to summarize the talk in about four bullet points. Fully understand the situation before you dive in. Mistakes I've made in my own career is being too eager to start, not measuring the data enough to begin with. It's really embarrassing when I tell a client, hey, your site's faster. And they're like, well, how? It's like, uh, ooh. Well, I've got a web page test from six weeks ago that I can compare it against. No, I need to make sure I spend a lot of time capturing the before. Next, maximize the work not done. Like I said before, it's just as important to know what not to do as it is to know what to do. Calculate the value of a project. Don't start a project until everyone knows what it's worth, because how do you know what to charge? How does a client know it's been successful, right? And finally, know when to stop. You will end up optimizing to a local maximum. You will get blindsided, you'll get blinkered, and you'll get obsessed. Um, that is the talk done. If you want any of the good stuff, you know where to find me. But thank you very much for listening.